Right, so my name is Ashley. I'm the Volunteer and Outreach Coordinator here at Napa RCD. Um, we do a lot of different things here in Napa County um, from community events like this and, and the rest of Bay Friendly Garden Month to youth education to, you know, lectures about wildlife and um, things like that to um, helping our, you know, vineyard managers and growers sort of build soil health um, on their land that they're trying to use to, you know, grow some really lovely wine for us all. So we do all kinds of things, but it all boils down to helping you take care of the land, water, soil, and wildlife here in Napa County. So thank you all for joining us tonight. I'm really excited to have you here. This is our last um, long form presentation for Bay Friendly Garden Month. Um, we've had a whole month of really great programming and Suzanne has been a part of that in you know, a couple different ways. Um, so thank you, Suzanne, for joining us again. Um, we are hosting this talk in partnership uh, with the City of Napa Water Division. So we're super thankful for their uh, their partnership throughout this whole month and, and for this program in particular as well. Um, if you are not already signed up for emails with Napa RCD, feel free to, whether you're on Facebook or on Zoom, uh, feel free to send me your email um, in the chat, um, or you can just send me an email um, to my own email, which I'll add to the chat so that you aren't sharing your email with the world. Um, and I'll get you signed up for our emails and newsletter. So um, right now we are you know, coming off of, you know, I think 70 or so days of sheltering in place here in the Bay Area. And um, during that time, Napa RCD has put together weekly digests to help keep all of us connected to sort of the natural areas and the environmental um, areas around us. So along with our monthly newsletters, uh, we also send out weekly digests to everybody right now. So we can um, look forward to those if you um, decide to join our email list. Um, so we are, like I said, we're coming to the end of Bay Friendly Garden Month. Um, we have a whole bunch of live recordings and sort of re recorded long form videos and things like that on our page. So uh, just see all of those resources that have been made available. Feel free to visit NapaRCD.org slash 2020 Garden Month. Um, and you'll see all the wonderful things that we've um, put together for you so far this month. And right now, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna turn it over to uh, Suzanne Von Tempo. She's a program manager at Our Water, Our World, and she's going to be our speak, our featured speaker for this evening. So, Suzanne, take it away. Thank you so much. Um, thank you, everyone, for joining us tonight. We are going to talk about how you can grow the garden of your dreams with integrated pest management. Um, and essentially, integrated pest management is going to be a less toxic approach to gardening, and we're going to really dive into that a lot. So I'm going to start by sharing what we're going to learn uh, tonight. So number one, the principles of integrated pest management or, you know, for short IPM, and then why working with an IPM approach equals less pest problems, and then how your garden is a dynamic ecosystem. So before I dive into what integrated pest management is, I wanted to uh, Ashley's created a poll to see how many of you joined our last program that we uh, had two weeks ago about organic gardening, uh, organic vegetable gardening. So if you don't For those mind. of you on Zoom, um, you should be seeing um, a little pop-up box. Um, if you could just go ahead and answer that for me, um, that would be great. And for those of you, if you're tuning in on Facebook, um, please feel free to type in the chat box either yes or no, um, and I'll be able to figure out what that means uh, both now and hopefully in the future. I'll give maybe another five, five or six seconds to let people vote. Great. I'm just curious so that uh, there is some repeat uh, material and if I know that you have joined, I don't have to dive too much into it or if no one has joined or joined two weeks ago, then I know that I can, um, there won't be any repeats. And that's um, always nice because no one really wants to hear the same stuff. Right. So it looks like um, most of our viewers on Facebook have joined um, last week or last, not last week, at our last program. And three out of the 75% um, of our people on Zoom are, have attended um, the last program. Okay, great. Okay, awesome. This is great. That's what I was hoping for. Okay, so nice to see your faces again. Thanks for joining. So let's dive into what integrated pest management is. 
Um, I also usually like to ask how many people have heard of integrated pest management. So since um, the, there's two faces I can see, if you just want to raise your hand and say you have heard of it, that's great. Okay, awesome. So I like to explain it as a decision-making process. Um, it's kind of a matrix where we're going to look at the system as a whole. In this case, it's going to be our garden or our landscape. Uh, and then it, we're going to really um, dive in to see what, to discover what the problem at hand really is. Oftentimes what we see are actually symptoms of the problem, and that's what we go ahead and try to ad address. We're not really honing in on the problem uh, that exists. And then from there, once we can identify the problem, we want to decide if we can live with it. Is, uh, is this something that we know is going to be short term and it's going to pass in a couple of days, in a couple of weeks? Or is it something that we actually need to address and take action? And then from there, the types of actions that we take are actually broken down into a couple different categories, which is what we're going to be diving into. Those categories are going to be cultural controls, mechanical controls, biological controls, and then chemical controls or pesticides. These are always going to be used as a last resort, and we're always going to use the least toxic whenever possible. Now, one caveat, if you have a plant that is always uh, faced with a pest problem, uh, it doesn't matter how much you're going to be spraying or how much effort you take to try to uh, manage that problem with the pesticide. Give yourself permission and consider just removing the plant altogether. And we're going to learn why. Sometimes plants just are not in the right place. This is an IPM pyramid. Um, this is something that we might uh, see at other classes or maybe in a textbook. Uh, I just like to kind of uh, throw this in so that we can uh, have a visual of what integrated pest management is. And, and you'll see at the bottom prevention. Prevention is going to be the foundation of integrated pest management or the way we manage pest problems around the garden. So it is the foundation. And then from there we work with cultural controls, which I consider uh, bolstering the health of the environment. And then we work with the tools, the physical or the mechanical controls. And then we work with biological controls, inviting the beneficial insects in, and then always chemical controls uh, as a last resort. So we start with prevention. And what I like to say is what does prevention look like to you? So prevention could be setting up an irrigation system so that my plants are getting watered properly so they're not going to be under a lot of stress. Um, or putting up a deer fencing or what we were just talking about a, a moment ago is how can we prevent the raccoons from getting into my raised beds, uh, putting some type of a barrier up, working with yellow jacket traps because we know yellow jacket season is uh, just around the corner. Or sanitation, um, this is a huge category. Uh, one example of sanitation is maybe uh, cleaning up any of the fallen apples uh, in, in, during the summer and fall months to prevent uh, inviting other critters like raccoons or rats or even deer, or cleaning up uh, any apples on the apple tree over the winter to prevent um, coddling moths from overwintering. So these are different types of things that we look at prevention. And then from there, we want to always uh, properly identify pest problems. So this is a little challenging. It's not always easy. Uh, misidentifying uh, pests is not so uncommon, but uh, I like to, I'm gonna give you uh, some resources that will help support you and know that um, at the end of the program, my contact information is available for you. So you can always reach out to me if there's a question about pest problems moving forward. But we always wanna identify the pest. We want to understand that that life cycle of that pest because oftentimes as I mentioned before it could be very short term and may, we might not need to take any action if we understand that life cycle like the spittle bugs we see those spittle bugs really really early on uh, right like around March ish uh, and really they're so short term they are typically just in our gardens for about a week or two and really just blasting them off with water is all we need to do but if you don't understand that uh, I get this question all the time where it's like, oh, I've got these spittle bugs. What do I do? So, and then understanding the pests, the habit and the timing of the pest. So as I mentioned with the spittle bugs, I know they're always going to come in uh, very early uh, before, you know, very early spring. And 
And I know that they're going to be on multiple plants. It's not, they're not gonna favor just one host. And then we want to understand who the natural enemies of that pest might be so that we can look out for them and see if they're present. Because if they're present, then we sure as heck don't wanna use any pesticides, even the eco-friendly ones. These are the two resources that I'd like to uh, introduce you to uh, if you're not already familiar with them. Uh, this is going to be uh, really valuable pest problem solving resources. So Our Water, Our World, their website, uh, I am the program manager of this program. It, this has two resources for you. One, these are going to be called fact sheets. The fact sheets, uh, there's a library of them and they're broken down by different uh, topics such as like ants, aphids, yellow jackets, uh, growing beautiful roses or you know uh, mosquitoes, things like that. We can read these and they're going to give you an integrated pest management education on managing those pest problems. The other really cool resource on this website is if you notice, it might be hard to see, but um, on the home page of Our Water, Our World, there is a, a little button there. It's a link that says, ask our expert. You can click Click on that, it opens up to an email format where you can ask a question. That email gets sent to BERC. It's the Bio Integral Research Center in the East Bay. It's a team of entomologists and chemists, and they'll re reply to your question within 24 hours, Monday through Friday, and they'll give you some really, really good information on the pest and how to manage it and uh, different types of uh, controls, be it you know mechanical controls or chemical controls and so forth. So really great resource for you there. And then of course, our UCIPM uh, website. And uh, the way I use the UCIPM website is if I have a, a plant that I see a pest on and I'm not really familiar with that pest or maybe I'm a little unsure, in the search bar right here on the uh, UCIPM website, let's say it's rosemary and I've got a mystery pest on rosemary. I'm just going to type rosemary into that search bar and what pops up is a page of all the different type of pests, insects and diseases that rosemary could possibly be afflicted, afflicted with. So it's a good way to help us go through pest identification, narrowing down pest problems when we're not exactly sure. So a great catalog, a great resource. So I just wanted to share that with you. Okay. From there, we're going to start with cultural controls because what I shared is cultural controls is really how we bolster the health of the garden because when we have a healthy garden, we have less pest problems. So I mentioned this in my last program is it's really important to understand what kind of soil you have. And uh, if we were not sure what kind of soil we have, we could do this really cool uh, soil jar test where you put some soil in a jar, you fill it with water, and then you let it sit there for uh, maybe a couple hours. And then we can kind of see the, uh, how the soil is gonna separate. And it gives us an idea if it's gonna be really heavy with clay or super sandy or very silty, things like that. And the reason why this is so important is because we wanna understand how water moves through the soil. Understanding how water moves through the soil is going to help us identify uh, problems that could be coming up in the garden, especially when the irrigation isn't working. Uh, we build healthy soil, as I shared before, by mending the soils with good quality compost, by working with organic fertilizers always. We want to get off those synthetics because they're high in salts, they're detrimental to the soil, they act like steroids to the plants. The organic fertilizers are going to be a natural way to support the health of the plant. And then we're going to mulch uh, most all areas of our garden to help uh, in increase the health of the garden overall. We're going to plant the right plant in the right place. Remember, we're going to understand the sun exposure in our garden. We're going to understand uh, the, the size. How much space do we have to actually grow plants? And this is something that we don't always consider because when we're at the garden center, the plants are small. And we don't consider that a plant that's this that this big at the time of buying it can maybe grow to be you know bigger than we are so understanding the the specs of the plant and remember i mentioned these tags before these tags have a lot of really great information on what the size of the plant is going to be at maturity and we always want to gauge that to the space to fit perfectly into our garden because we don't want to be in a place where we're going to have to do a lot of extra pruning 
We really want the plant to grow into what we have. Um, and then as I mentioned before, if there is a plant that just isn't doing well, remember all those years of drought we had, we saw a lot of plants that maybe uh, weren't thriving. So, you know, even though you know, we come, become so attached to our plants, we're very sentimental when it comes to our plants. But if there is something that really isn't working, feel free just to remove it. Give yourself that permission just to get rid of it, start something that don't feel too bad. Uh, if you do, we have that support group we meet on Thursday nights. Uh, we could talk about that later. But in the meantime, remember the right plant in the right place is going to be key. Planting for our Bay Area climates. Uh, these are some really cool resources. I like to throw out plant lists that maybe you wouldn't be so aware of, but the Wulkos, uh, uh, Plant list is pretty great for uh, landscape plants for our Bay Area. Uh, the California Native Plant Society, of course, is going to have an amazing plant list. And then uh, the Basqua plant list, which is the Bay Area Water Supply and Conservation Agency. Not many people know about these resources, but uh, they have an amazing list of plants that are going to thrive perfectly well in our greater Bay Area climate. Uh, email me later if you, you know, need to get a reminder on these or check out this video after we're done. Hydrozoning zoning and xeriscaping, it means planting plants with similar water needs together. So we always want to identify what the water needs of the plant are and group them together. This is also going to support the health of the garden overall. And then, of course, we've seen this picture before. When we water, we want to water deeply and less often. So as plants uh, are become established, remember it takes one to two years for perennials, shrubs, and trees to become established. We're going to baby those root systems. We're going to coax those root, root systems out and down with water. Because remember, roots are only going to go where the water goes. So ideally, we always want to get to the illustration I drew on the far right, where we have nice, deep, even root systems. We're watering deeply, and we're letting the top few inches of the soil dry out before watering again on established plants. And then we've talked about irrigation systems before. They're not set it and forget it. But this is a really good time of the year to go through, turn your irrigation systems on manual, or if you know what time each station is scheduled to go on, go look, listen, uh, uh, observe, is the irrigation really working? And then if we have the irrigation set up uh, let's say the irrigation went on this morning, today's Wednesday, and it's we have it scheduled to go on again on Friday. Now this week we had a lot of heat. So let's just say it was a normal temperature. We didn't have an excessive spike in heat. Uh, but let's say it's Friday morning and we know the irrigation is going to go on again. Let's feel the soil. Is the soil dry or is it still wet? If the soil is still wet, the irrigation does not need to go on. Let's change that to maybe uh, not come on again until Saturday. So we want to be really familiar with how water is moving through the soil, how the water is evaporating out of the soil, and uh, are we watering deep enough and are we watering um, uh, too frequently. The reason why I mention this uh, and I talk about it so much is because overwatering is the number one reason why plants die. And then, of course, not watering the plants enough deeply uh, is the other reason why plants die. And these are very, very common uh, problems that we see. Uh, and then we want to increase the permeable surfaces whenever possible. So if we are looking at a new landscape project, uh, either to remove concrete or to add a patio, uh, make it a, a permeable surface. Use the decomposed granite so that uh, the water can percolate through. And the reason why is we want to capture as much water on site whenever possible, because it also increases the health of the soil, the microbiology, and the root systems of the plants around. All right. Any questions? You guys just learned a lot. So any questions about uh, the cultural controls or uh, prevention, although we're going to get into more some more preventative means in a minute, but really bolstering the health of the garden. Okay, good. I was I wasn't I was thinking it was still a little early, but I just like to throw it in there. 
We're good, Ashley. Yes. Uh, so Facebook Live runs about mm, about twenty to thirty seconds behind the Zoom. Okay. So let's maybe um, give that a second for it's just now caught up. So let's maybe give them a second to actually type in some questions. Okay. Perfect. It looks like we are all good. Okay, awesome. All right, so now we're going to talk about mechanical controls. And this is actually one of my favorite categories because this is where we get to be really crafty. This is where we get to be smarter than the gophers. We get to be smarter than the rats and smarter than the squirrels, even though it might not always seem that way. When we talk about mechanical controls, we talk about uh, all the tools that we would be using in the garden. And so I'm a huge fan of working with barriers. So we've got some obvious barriers like deer fencing or bird netting. Um, and yes, I know that bird netting can be a real pain uh, because it's not always easy to put on or take off. I've learned to roll my bird netting up on a dowel, like a um, you know, from the closets, when it, you could just go to the hardware store and get uh, a wooden dowel, I roll mine up and actually that really has saved the, uh, the frustration. I'll just leave it at as a nice word, the frustration. Uh, and then I also encourage people to prune their fruit trees so that they're at a manageable size. I know there was a time where, uh, you know, my auntie, she's got an apple tree that's, gosh, 40 feet big around. That's kind of an old way of looking at fruit trees. The modern way is really making sure we can access the tree from all points with a very short ladder. We want to be able and be able to harvest the fruit, you know, and be able to manage. So when we can manage our fruit trees that way, we actually put the bird netting on with a lot more ease. The bird netting is also going to help prevent squirrels from getting into the trees uh, as long as we have it um, secured at the bottom so that squirrels can't get in anyway because they're smart. Gopher baskets are going to be an awesome barrier or really lining the bottom of raised beds with half inch hardware cloth or proper gopher wire. Screens and windows are also a barrier to prevent flying insects from coming in our house. Um, I want to point out this um, you know, the row cover that we see is going to be a great barrier, but when we use row cover, we want to make sure that the insects are not inside and that we're not capturing them in. So this is going to be a great tool to keep out um, the cabbage moths or the vegetable leaf miner. However, we've always, we've already had those insects in that area of the garden. A lot of times the larva of those insects or eggs of those insects are hibernating in the soil. So we always wanna make sure that area is clean of those insects before we actually use that type of barrier or we're locking them in. Um, these are the exclusion uh, cages that I like to use. I'm not sure if I invented this, but I, I have a big influence on people actually creating these and using them whenever possible. So uh, exclusion cages or exclusion frames are really a way to uh, um, prevent raccoons, rats, birds, humans from getting into these areas of the garden. So uh, the photos actually on the left and the right are a public education garden in San Francisco. The one on the left is just half inch hardware cloth on uh, uh, PVC. It is very, you know, uh, basic. Whereas the photo on the right, they just had this awesome uh, team called Big Fun Gardens build these exclusion um, cages where they actually open up. Specifically, those are made with half inch, I'm sorry, quarter inch hardware cloth because they were having rat problems uh, getting into their raised beds. Not fun. And then picture in the middle, these are actually the baskets I make uh, with poultry wire or, you know, you know, for chicken coops. And I just have these on these one by one frames and I can actually lift them up. They're super lightweight and I can put them over. Uh, well, they fit on my raised beds, but also you see uh, strawberries or, you know, whatever uh, plants I think that I need to have exclusion from. So this is gonna be really helpful uh, for uh, preventing even raccoons from coming in. Okay. Uh, 
Uh, and then sheet mulching is another barrier that I'm a huge fan of. You take advantage of all of those uh, chewy boxes or Amazon boxes that are showing up and we're going to layer them multiple times, get a nice thick layer of mulch, no less than three inches over the top. And this is going to prevent weeds from growing anywhere from nine to 18 months. It's really quite remarkable. And then working with traps. Um, I we're going to work with traps in a number of different ways. So sometimes we're working with the pheromone traps or those like yellow and blue sticky insect traps as indicators or monitoring devices, such as for coddling moths and the apples, um, things like that. However, uh, they are also going to be capturing insects that they, you know, that get stuck to them. And so we're eliminating populations. But a lot of times the sticky traps are not necessarily designed for controls, but more in monitoring. However, then we have uh, like the yellow jacket traps and uh, fly traps are going to be excellent. The key with those is to get them out early before the problem really is uh, on. The key with yellow jacket traps is to get them out on that first warm weekend, typically in March, when the queens are out looking for a new nest to build. So that's when we can capture the queen. We have eliminated over a thousand yellow jackets. So that's when we have success. And then of course, replacing those attractants according to the directions. Uh, gopher traps are also going to be employed, uh, thing, and slug and snail traps, things like that. Any questions? So I did, Suzanne, get a couple of questions. Well, one question that came up from the last I didn't quite wait long enough. Um, so if you would like, I can either save it to the end yeah. uh, or no, I can do it right now. Okay. Yeah. So question from John, are there any good resources? I assume he's talking about online resources available for designing gardens, similar to the earlier slide that you showed. The earlier slide, meaning the one with the blueprint uh, while you were discussing xeriscaping. That's uh, really neat. Now, I happen to also work with a program that's in Sonoma County, well, Sonoma and Marin County, that's called Water Smart Plant. It's a Water Smart Plant program. They have a website that has a number of um, templates to, for uh, specifically for uh, low water usage. So you can check that out. I'm sure Napa County, like the um, Napa County Master Gardeners, they might have a similar um, uh, link to their website about, uh, you know, design templates. Um, sometimes the Napa, sometimes the um, different chapters of the Calif uh, Cal Native Plant Society. So you might check out the Napa Cal Native Plant Society and see if they've got templates as well. And then I've been noticing lately that um, Cal Fire it has been really beefing up their website and getting these uh, also plant lists that are going to be great and then also with the design templates. So those are good starts and if you happen to uh, not find what you're looking for, please email me and I will get you some more resources. So thank you for asking that question. Um, so we have another question from Veronica. Are there effective snail, are there, I think the, I'll put the emphasis on the right word. Are there effective snail slug traps? Um, I, oh, okay. I like to use the slug board or snail board. Um, it's uh, like a board that has like maybe one by ones underneath it. So it's like actually slightly elevated. And what happens is, is that slugs and snails do not like the heat of the day. They're looking for shade, uh, especially moist shade. So when we have a slug board, uh, they go under there. It's kind of moist because of the condensation of the soil. And then I come up and I lift up that board and I can scrape them all off uh, into soapy water. I don't like slugs or snails at all. They make me crazy. So that's actually very effective. I have tried the beer traps. Um, what I've discovered is that slugs and snails are not so successful to go into their little uh, party bowl of beer, but the roly polies who will enjoy my little vegetable starts 
really, uh, it's a great trap for roly polies. So if you're finding roly polies, the little sow bugs that are just annihilating your vegetable starts, the beer traps work really great for them, not so much the slugs and snails. So, um, and then I also put little barriers around my uh, slugs and snails um, of uh, like a yogurt container that I've cut the bottom off. So now I've got a plastic sleeve and I put the copper tape around that. The slugs and snails do, will not cross the copper. So that's going to be a really nice way uh, to create a barrier to prevent them. So hopefully that answered, uh, that offered some support. Okay. All right, let's keep going. So biological controls. This is definitely by far the most fun of the category, if you ask me. So we've talked about these flowers before, uh, but let's ask a question and you guys could put the answer in the chat and Ashley can uh, let me know. But what do these flowers have in common? And we'll, we'll also give people a little time to catch up on the, uh, the Facebook feed as well. Okay. And for anybody who's on, on Zoom, if you have not yet found the chat box, if you hover over the bottom of your screen, there should be a little, um, a little black bar that pops up with the option to open up a chat. Okay. So do you want me to shout them out when they come in or would you like me to read them out at a certain point? Oh, no, you could just read them as they start coming in. Okay. Um, from Facebook, we have attract pollinators. Um, and I think our, our Zoom folks are, are tuning in but not, uh, not wanting to type in. Okay. Well, they absolutely do attract pollinators. They actually attract uh, many beneficial insects. But the cool thing that these all have in common is that they're actually all flowers with uh, um, actually clusters of tiny flowers. So for instance, the Gallardia, the Ridgeron, the Cosmos, the flowers that look like a daisy or a sunflower, uh, what we're looking at is actually those petals are actually rays. And what we see in the middle, the button in the middle or the little cone in the middle, that's actually made up of hundreds of tiny, tiny microflowers. So uh, that's going to be really important. The other important, important uh, feature I like to point out is like with the yarrow or with the alyssum down in the corner, these are actually uh, flat um, or like slightly domed uh, clusters of lots of tiny flowers as well. And the reason why tiny flowers are so important is because so many of our pollinators and micro pollinators are tiny looking for little flowers. Now remember, the color, the variety of color is also going to be really important. And white is also a color that is important in the scheme of things. So a couple things I wanna share is that what we're going to do is we're going to, uh, we want to invite the three Ps. We want to invite the pollinators, the predators, and the parasites. So um, the, the parasitic insects, such as parasitic wasps, those are very, very tiny. Um, and oftentimes we don't really recognize them. When we see them, they look like little micro flies or even slightly bigger than like a fungus gnat flying around. Oftentimes we'll see them like on parsley or cilantro flowers, dill, things like that. Um, what we understand is that so often the adult of our predator insects, such as the lacewings, the hoverflies, the ladybugs, they actually are looking for a nectar source or a, you know, a pollen that they could feed off of. So that's why it's so important to have this variety of flowering plants that can offer nectar sources and pollen. Because if they feel really comfortable, then they're going to lay their eggs and those eggs are going to hatch and we're going to have this larva of these predator insects, such as our lacewing larva, the aphid uh, lion, or the surfeit fly larva that is that kind of green caterpillary-like thing with the racing stripes, or the ladybug larva. These are all going for protein meals. It's the larva phase of these insects that's really doing the damage, taking down the populations of the bad bugs. So when we can invite 
these insects in the garden, then we know that we've created habitat for them that makes it really desirable for them. And then of course, you know, inviting in the pollinators so that we can have, uh, you know, they can fertilize our flowers and we can increase the yields of our food crops. And then I'm not sure if any of you have seen uh, the tomato hornworm with these little beads on the back. This little tomato hornworm thought it was getting bedazzled with some gems. Sadly, those are actually the eggs of a wasp that um, are going to then go in and once they hatch, dive in and eat the inside of that caterpillar it's really gross but uh that's where they got the idea for that movie aliens with sigourney weaver um, if we are looking to buy insects online, I like to introduce you to this really cool uh, resource. This is Rincon Vitova. They're down in Ventura. Check out their website. It is a wealth of information. And if you can get geeked out like I do, be prepared to be on this website for at least an hour or two. There are beneficial insects for every single problem uh, pest that we have, including ladybugs that eat powdery mildew. So awesome. From there, we can also uh, invite our native bees to our gardens by building a bee nesting block. Uh, understand that 30% uh, of our native bees actually are looking for uh, cavities to dwell in, similar to these bee nesting blocks. And 70% of our native bees actually are ground dwellers. So when I was talking about mulching the garden, and I said mulch almost everywhere, but we always want to leave sections of the garden uh, raw, untended, unmulched, just so that we can have uh, those ground dwellers have access to the soil. And, um, and typically it's usually like a sunny area, maybe the behind a perennial border where it's up against the fence where sun gets back there, no one's gonna see anyway if you don't have mulch. So uh, it's a really great time to invite our native pollinators to the garden. We want to create biodiversity by providing habitat, and we do that by planting a variety of flowering trees, shrubs, and perennials. So here, this is another picture of San Francisco's public education garden. I'm an educator there. That's why I happen to have a lot of photos from that garden. It's called Garden for the Environment. But you'll see along the side of uh, the raised beds that they have uh, is just a whole hedgerow of flowering things. So when we can have, um, and we also live in a climate where we can actually have something in flowering just about year round. So um, understand that during the very, very cold days of winter when we don't have a lot of things in flower, that's okay because a lot of our beneficial insects are not that active during that time anyway. They're hibernating. So when we can have flowering things throughout the year, uh, such as some of our early bloomers like ceanothus and such, all the way to our late bloomers, some of the asters, then we're able to feed our uh, beneficial insects and pollinators throughout uh, the expanded months. We want to offer a water source, especially during these hot days. So I'm not sure if any of you get my little newsletter, but I, I gave everyone a, some tips on how to manage their gardens for these upcoming uh, hot uh, days. Um, Offering a little water source for our pollinators. Uh, I have my little bird bath with actually pebbles in it. Uh, the Mexican pebbles I got from the garden center. And I have the pebbles kind of built up so that the butterflies and bees can land on the pebbles like a landing pad and then access the water without drowning. So I don't have to worry about mosquitoes because my bird bath is very shallow. That water evaporates out pretty much by the end of the day, and then I just refill it. If it is a bird bath that is not evaporating out that quickly, then I would blast it out daily, clean it out to make sure that we are not creating a vector for mosquitoes because we know how bad that can be. Uh, I do let some of my flowers go to seed. I will not deadhead all of the flowers when I know it's coming to the end of the season because I know that a lot of times those uh, flower heads have uh, important seeds for birds and also uh, tufts similar to like the Japanese anemones or the clematis. You know how it gets those little tufts? The birds use that material for nesting. I like to use a chunky arbor mulch because when I mulch my garden with a chunky arbor mulch, not only does it uh, decompose a little slower, it actually provides habitat for a lot of our beneficial insects. 
And we talked about the bee nesting block and also the ground dwelling bees. So I like to invite the birds whenever possible because 90% of uh, birds throughout, 90% of the birds uh, throughout their uh, life cycle are going to feed on insects. Even hummingbirds will bring little tiny gnats to their young for protein. I like to plant, uh, encourage people to plant a variety of trees and shrubs uh, whenever possible, kind of clustered if they can to provide nesting uh, places and uh, shelter for birds. Um, and I'm not a fan of bringing bird feeders into the garden because of uh, rats and squirrels can be a problem. But when I have a diversity of uh, plants, especially um, like echinacea, uh, sunflowers, I will plant sunflowers specifically for my nut hatches. So this is when we're inviting the birds in without having the risk of inviting other pests in. Okay, any questions? You are moving through this so so fast. We have one question. Okay, great. Um, where can I go to find a plan to build or buy a bee nesting block? Do you have any good tips on where oh, to go? Yeah, so Xerxes Society. So um, let me just back up really fast if you guys don't mind. I'm sorry, I don't want to be. Um, see, uh, we can, this is where I got this template was the Xerces Society, so Xerces.org. You can also do a Google search where uh, bee nesting block and typically the photo on the uh, right comes up as a template. The trick is, is that uh, you need to have a drill press mm -hmm. or be really, really good with a handheld drill. But other than that, um, it's very simple. And the trick is, is we always wanna have the uh, bee nesting block positioned where it's getting morning sun so straight east or uh, southeast is the positioning. So because it wants to get warmed up in the morning. And then we want to have it uh, no uh, shorter than eight inches off the ground. It really has to be a little higher than that. Okay, so hopefully that was helpful. Yeah, that's great. Okay. Um, the other question we have is what is chunky arbor mulch? Uh, well, if you go to a landscape supply, it's typically called arbor mulch, and it's usually the least expensive to buy in bulk. If you happen to have a tree service come and do any tree trimming, they're going to have that tree, tree chipper where the branches go through the chipper. It comes out, it's a little bit more rough, a little bit more coarse. It's not going to be as pretty as like maybe a, a fir bark, like quarter inch fir bark or like a shredded cedar. So, but if you are buying mulch by the bag, then I would probably go for a shredded cedar because that's going to be a little chunkier. Um, yeah, that's probably what I would recommend. All right, well, let's keep going. Okay, so the last category in our IPM strategy is chemical controls or pesticides. And as I mentioned, we're always going to use these as a last resort. It's really important to know your target. We wanna, that's why identifying the pest and really making sure you're 100% on knowing what that pest is is so important. Oftentimes, I can't tell you uh, every spring when I have traditionally worked in stores, not this year so much because we're sheltering in place, but in the past, I will get people that bring in a Ziploc baggie full of ladybug larvae freaking out saying, I've got these all over my garden and they're eating my plants. And I have to let them know, because they're coming in looking for a pesticide to kill them, that this is actually ladybug larva. I have to prove it by getting out my phone and doing a search and handing them a brochure that says that's what they are. And then I encourage them to release them back into the garden because they're actually eating the bugs that are eating plants. So knowing our target is key. We're always going to use less toxic, eco-friendly products. You can get a list of those products back on that Our Water, Our World website. Uh, and those fact sheets always have uh, the ingredients, the active ingredients that is going to be less toxic for that pest problem. We want to uh, 
spray at the apply the pesticide according to the label the instructions on the label we want to understand how that active ingredient works whenever possible and then we're going to apply the pesticides ideally towards the end of the day when our beneficial insects are less likely to be active so right now is actually a perfect time if we needed to spray a pesticide for a number of reasons. This is typically when those afternoon winds die down. We never wanna spray when there's a breeze more than five miles an hour. We never wanna spray when there is excessive heat or frost in the future of 24 to 48 hours or rain for that matter. We want to be able to apply our pesticide at this time of the day, it is dry by the morning. And the cool thing about eco-friendly pesticides is that they don't have any residuals that are gonna be harmful for our beneficial insects, for our environment or our waterways. So we can uh, apply these pesticides in the evening, they're dry by morning, Beneficial insects can enter those areas, our pets, our children, and the residuals are not going to be there that are going to be toxic for any of the above. Um, and I also like to share, we want to take advantage of the dormant season. When we have uh, our fruit trees uh, during in dormant mode or roses in dormant mode, uh, we could take advantage uh, spraying with our eco fungicides and our horticulture oils because we're using less pesticides because there's less square uh, uh, surface area. We don't have any leaves in competition. We're able to really saturate those branches and also understand during the winter months, the beneficial insects are not going to be active. So it's going to be a really good way to use uh, a pesticide very effectively. We want to understand that even though we're working with uh, uh, eco-pesticides, that all pesticides are designed to kill something. So even the eco-pesticides like neem, insecticidal soap, we want to make sure we're using, wearing long sleeves, we're wearing pants, we're wearing proper shoes. We're not out there in our flip-flops and short shorts spraying because we don't know what kind of dermal reaction we might get. Uh, we can uh, easily uh, get a rash, possibly a reaction on our skin or get the spray by accident in our eyes or on our face. So again, we always want to make sure we're wearing some type of protection. However, it doesn't have to be a crazy gas mask like in this picture, but understand that even eco-pesticides are, are pesticides, like I said, designed to kill something and they are not risk-free. All right, we're going to talk about uh, a little bit of uh, an example of integrated pest management problem solving before we wrap up. So I wanted to focus in on the aphids because it seems like we're all faced with aphids. And aphids are a problem that we know come up every spring. As soon as uh, that new flush of growth happens on our plants, aphids arrive. Now, why is that? Because aphids are not ding-dongs. They know that new flush is tender. They can get in there with their sucking mouth parts. It's because that uh, tissue is soft. And then all those plant sugars are just delicious. So because I know aphids are going to come every spring and they pretty much go away once the heat comes on, they don't like the heat. They're going to come back a little bit in the fall, but spring is when they go crazy. A couple things I know about aphids is that there's about two or over 200 different species of aphids in the Bay Area, right? Just what you wanted to hear. And, uh, but the good news is, is that each aphid is uh, a specific color and that specific color aphid only likes that specific plant. So we see that dark charcoal aphid loves kale. We see the black aphid loves the fava beans. We see that the lime kind of colored aphid loves roses. The orange one likes the escapulus and so forth. So if I've got aphids on my roses, I don't have to worry about the, those same aphids getting on my vegetable starts or on my lavender or what, any other plants in the garden because I know they're only going for that, aph uh, for that rose or for that specific plant. So a couple things to keep in mind. We could, um, we know that uh, what increases aphids is working with synthetic fertilizers. The reason why is because synthetic fertilizers, as I mentioned before, act like steroids. They are always pushing a lot of new growth. And as I just shared, the aphids, similar to other insects, 
take advantage of those tender sugary new growth and they're going to be attracted to them and that's when we're going to have a problem when we can work with organic fertilizers we're not going to see that uh, excessive pruning so if we're pruning uh plants a lot we're going to also encourage a lot of new growth which is also going to invite insects uh, when we see ants protect like growing up into a plum tree or into a fruit tree or any other uh, perennial a lot of times when we see ants we know that's an indicator of an aphid problem because the ants like to farm the the honeydew those sugary secretions from the aphids um, and then we also know when we are using a lot of pesticides even eco-friendly ones if we're using them during the day when we see beneficial insects present we're sadly killing off our beneficial insects so now we don't have those predators that can be keeping things in uh, balance ways to reduce aphids use organic fertilizers, reduce pruning, uh, understand the timing of when we have to prune a plant such as citrus. We might want to uh, prune uh, at a different time of year uh, later in the summer, right before the fall or right around the fall so that new growth can harden off before a frost. We want to invite the beneficial insects by planting a diversity of flowering plants. Blasting aphids off with roses, uh, with water, does a great job. Imagine a fire hose of water stream coming out and like knocking over like a small person, a small child. That's essentially what's happening when we're blasting aphids off. They're getting ripped off that plant and they are not coming back. Uh, I will go through my kale and my chard and I'll just wipe the aphids off. It's kind of gross, but very effective. Uh, and then of course, really using the most narrow range pesticide if whenever possible, uh, such as insecticidal soap or horticultural oils if we want to uh, use a product. So that's a really great example of integrated pest management for aphids. So. I just want to come circle back to IPM. Remember, it's a decision-making process. You see how aphids, I had that broken down into three different screens because it's a, it's, a, it's a way we have to look at things. It's just not a silver bullet. It's we have to implement different strategies to solve the problem for long-term success. So we're going to look at the garden as a whole. We're going to be prepared. We know aphids are coming. We're going to do preventative means, maybe do a dormant spray. We're going to, uh, uh, when they arrive, we're going to blast them off with water. Uh, when we decide that we can't live with the situation anymore, then yes, maybe we will uh, buy some ladybugs or you know order some uh, in, uh, beneficial insects to come in. We're going to plant flowering plants all around our vegetable garden and other areas to invite these beneficials in. And if that still isn't working, then yes, we can go for a um, a very narrow spectrum pesticide such as insecticidal soap. Always use it according to the directions on the label. That's key. So, an overview. We tips on maintaining your uh, sustainable garden of your dreams with the IPM approach is we're going to observe our garden. We're going to get up close and personal. We're going to really know what's going on. We are going to learn how we can prevent the pest problems that we have fa were faced with the year before. We're going to see, oh, take notes. We're going to see how we can improve, how we can do it better, what uh, strategies worked, which ones didn't. We're going to build our soil with compost, uh, organic fertilizers, and mulch. We're going to plant the right plant with the right place. We're going to water deeply and adjust those irrigation clocks according to the season. We're going to create biodiversity by planting beautiful flowering plants all around our garden to invite the beneficial insects and the pollinators. And then we're going to relax and we're going to enjoy it. So in close, before we go into more questions, I just want to remind everyone that when we try to pick out anything by itself, we find it hitched to everything else in the universe. I feel like this quote by John Muir speaks to integrated pest management so well. So I invite you to get out into your gardens, get curious, and start to discover all the fun things that, you, that your garden has for you because it's doing a lot more work for you than I, than I think. I'm learning and seeing new beneficial insects every single day. So anyway, thank you so much. Before we get to questions, I just want to say 
please always feel free to reach out to me. I, I'm, you can find me, my website is plantharmony.org. Sign up for my tips. I send them out about every week. Uh, that uh, helps through the seasons. Uh, I'm, it's relevant pest problems that I'm faced with or tips how to manage things. And then of course, there's more information on the countyofnapa.org uh, forward slash stormwater website. And let's have some more questions. Thank you. That was wonderful. Thank you, Suzanne. We do have a few more questions coming in. Um, our first question is from Wendy. Um, is anyone else, this is sort of a, I think, um, a message to everyone, but also maybe looking for your expertise in particular. Is anyone else in our area seeing roaches? We saw one in our garden and one in our kitchen sink. This is the first time we've ever seen them in Napa. I would love a natural solution to that problem before it gets out of hand. Yeah. Roaches are yucky. Um, I can share that roaches are all around um, and there's a lot of different species of roaches. So I'm in Sebastopol and we have field cockroaches uh, or they're also called fruit uh, cockroaches. So they're little, they've got a couple stripes on their back and they really just hang out outside. The good news is, is that they're food for the lizards, the frogs, the snakes, and the birds. So I, and I know that they don't want to come in. Um, the rare occasion when it gets really hot and dry is when we start to see cockroaches come in, the ones that normally wouldn't be in the house. Um, so for the most part, I might get a little freaked out by them, but I just let them be because they're a food source for these other important uh, critters. Inside the house, um, it's a bummer, but understand that it's not so unusual. They come in, uh, with uh, maybe cardboard, uh, uh, brown paper bags from the grocery store. I know that sounds gross, uh, but this is how they actually make their way in. They can come in sometimes uh, on packages or on groceries and maybe not necessarily in the box or the bag, but maybe on the products themselves. Um, so it's not so unusual. Um, the thing is, is if you just saw one, hopefully you got rid of it, you're freaked out, and now what you're going to do is monitor. So there are some things that I talked about before, like sticky traps as monitoring devices. You can go to your local hardware store and pick up uh, some of, uh, well, remember roach motels? You can still get those at the local uh, home improvement store or hardware store. They also just have regular cockroach uh, or basic uh, generic insect sticky traps and we put those around and the thing is is that these are not necessarily going to be controls but they're going to help us identify if the problem still is uh, is there if it still persists so I would encourage if you're uh, kind of freaked out and you just want to make sure that there are no more um, then get some sticky traps as monitoring devices from there you, I would encourage you to go to the Our Water, Our World website, read the fact sheet uh, that specifically talks about cockroaches. There are some active ingredients such as um, boric acid, active ingredient baits that are going to be very effective. And so they're going to be low on the toxins. They're going to be safe as long as we use it according to the directions. Excellent. So our next question is, are wasps always bad news? Can they be predators to any of the parasites we find in our gardens? So the parasitic wasps are not bad news. Those are actually beneficial and they're very, very tiny. So oftentimes when I use that word or introduce people to the whole category of parasitic wasps, we think of like the big wasps that will come around that are larger than yellow jackets and we get kind of freaked out. Well, uh, the parasitic wasps, as I mentioned, are tiny. We don't really recognize them as wasps. But I will share that wasps, the ones that we are kind of freaked out by, actually do visit flowers and uh, are sometimes visiting the flowers for nectar. This is something I just recently learned. So um, I, I think they're going for moisture for uh hydration as well. So yet another reason to put out water sources because even um, yellow jackets, wasps, uh, the mud daubers, things like that do also need uh, some water sources even during the uh, during the like dry summer days. Um, so they're not all bad. They're not going to all be bad. Okay, 
So the next question is from Maureen. Uh, we are in Benicia with cool, damp mornings and warm to hot afternoons. We have a problem with powdery mildew and rust on roses and some other plants. What is the best way to control this? So when it comes to roses, I like to uh, defoliate the bottom third of the plant. So I'll just be removing the leaves from the bottom third. This really helps with air circulation. I make sure I'm watering early in the morning when the soil and the air is both cool. I'm watering with a drip irrigation system so that that water is making direct contact with the soil. And then I'm um, also going to uh, prune my roses in such a way that they're open up like a, a, an urn. So there's a lot of airflow, as much airflow as possible. Know that there are some varieties of roses that are just super prone to rust and black spot and powdery mildew. Now, other plants that have Okay, let me keep talking about roses for a second. Uh, there are some things you can do. I like to uh, um, water a good quality organic liquid fertilizer throughout the growing season. When we can uh, fertilize or add a little bit more nutrients to the roses through the growing season uh, by watering about once a month with liquid organic fertilizer. This is in addition to the dry fertilizer I did back during the dormant season. Um, I will, um, I see healthier uh, roses that actually can still thrive really well and the rust and black spot has been reduced. I will say I have an Abraham Darby that is a David Austin and if you're familiar, if any one of you are familiar with David Austin's, they are prone to black spot and rust like crazy. So this year, uh, this past winter, I took advantage of the dormant season and I did spray with a copper soak fungicide. And I have to share right now, and I bolstered the health. I fertilized it really well. My new growth has come out beautiful um, and so far so good. Not a, a single little speckle of rust or black spot. So, okay, and then other powdery mildew, things like that. So if like, if we're talking about squashes, I always remove the uh, leaves that are really affected. Um, there are some really cool beneficial bacterias on the market. Um, Serenade is one, uh, Bayer Natria, or I'm sorry, it's actually Bio Advanced now. Natria has another one. Um, I would go to the local garden centers like Central Valley Builders in St. Helena, uh, Van Winden's in Napa. Um, who else am I missing? Uh, in Calistoga, you know, uh, Silverado Ace, they have a good selection of stuff up there too. But I, I would go to one of the garden centers and ask because I know both of those garden centers has the uh, Bacillus subtilis. It's a beneficial bacteria fungicide. So it's super narrow spectrum. It's a beneficial bacteria that actually uh, um, colonizes the uh, the powdery mildew, but you, the trick is you want to spray on the back of the leaf as well, not just the top. So underneath as well. Again, make sure the watering practice is the same as I mentioned for the rose. Remove the leaves that are really bad. Try to get more air circulation in, and just know some plants are really prone to powdery mildew. So hopefully that was helpful. Okay. Okay. Cool. Uh, our next question is, how would you fight ants that attract orphids? A sorry, let me, let me read this again. Uh, how would you fight ants which attract aphids? My parents had a big problem with both ants in a fruit tree and aphids in roses. Okay, um, so this is a common problem um, that, you know, we get asked a lot. Uh, and we, first we want to identify, we're gonna always try to get up close and personal as, as much as we can in our gardens. So that's why monitoring on a regular basis, getting in our gardens if we have the time to really observe. And then when we start to see ants trailing up into a plant, then as I mentioned, we know that's the indicator of, it could be thrips, it could be scale insects, it could be aphids. Then we observe. And then from there, uh, we try to blast the inside of that plant really well with water. Because when we can remove the aphids with that blast of water, now the ants don't have any food. They, we've just removed their food source. 
So that's another strategy is removing food sources from some of these nuisance or problem pests. There have been products on the market called Tanglefoot, although I'm not sure if they're still being manufactured. Um, I do know that there is a new type of product called uh, Sticky Insect Glue by BioCare, and I do believe Van Winden's has it. I'm not sure if Central Valley Builders has that product, but what we're going to do to prevent the ants, we're going to get some type of banding material, and the banding material can be a piece of paper that we've wrapped around the branch and taped it. And then we put that sticky paste on here, or we can use packing tape sticky side out as tight as possible, and then put that uh, sticky glue on. And what that's done is we've created a barrier and the ants are not able to cross it. And then we can remove that after we feel the problem has been resolved. Great. So I think our last question um, is, how to best control scales on a plum tree? We tried copper spray during the dormant season with no, without much success. So scale insect is actually an insect. So a fungicide would not work for that. Uh, a scale is um, kind of gross. Uh, when I was working in gardens, uh, one of my colleagues, she just loved just going through and scraping it off with her thumbs. I personally was totally freaked out by that. But uh, working with a horticultural oil is actually going to be a better choice for trying to suffocate those scale insects. The timing is the key. So um, scale insects um, have their, they're called crawlers when their uh, egg, the eggs have hatched, the crawlers, which we can't see uh, with our naked eye, we actually would have to look under a microscope. Uh, the crawlers start to move and uh, that's when they find a good place on that plant, such as your plum, to, to uh, take root, so to speak, and to just settle in and start to suck all the juices from the plant. When we work with horticultural oil, we're actually suffocating that insect and it's not able to uh, breathe and it dies fairly uh, effectively. The trick is, is the timing. And so if we didn't time it properly, then the crawlers could be moving. Maybe we've only killed the adults or vice versa. So uh, that's the challenge is making sure that we've done a thorough spray. Now, um, that's where proper pest ID comes in hand. So if you're unsure that it's scale insect from what I'm talking about, then again, reach out to me or go to the UCIPM website to confirm. Um, and hopefully that's helpful. But if we go back into those other best practices, so remember um, something I, I haven't really mentioned yet, plants, when they get insect problems, uh, it's usually indicator that they're under some kind of stress. Other than that, it's going to be very short term, like the aphid situation that happens in the spring. I know that that's going to go away because they're affecting, you know, it's really getting all that flood, the new flush, the, all the new growth. But if I have a plant that is infected by scale um, and it's persistent, then um, there are some plants such as abutilons that are just scale magnets. I would start to look at like my watering, make sure I'm watering deeply, I'm not watering around the crown, maybe the crown is buried. I'm gonna start to investigate and see if there's something else. Cause remember I was talking about a lot of times we see problems, it's actually symptoms of something else going on, especially with trees. I always like to kind of dig. I just discovered, I saw a branch of one of the plums on my property, it's dying. We dug around the crown, it was buried almost a foot. It's from the people that, the, I can't say that the people prior to living here buried it too deep. I don't know. I know it is a problem when you buy bare root. It's hard to judge where that proper uh, plate, the crown is. We always want to plant it properly. Not always easy to identify. But I also know over time with the activity of like critters such as voles and gophers and moles, soil kind of gets built up around the crowns. So it's really important to go and try to clear those the crown of our, our trees, our shrubs, our perennials out from of leaf debris of soil. We always want to feel a mat of root system and then we bring mulch to cover that out just a little bit, a couple inches away from the crown. 
I just wanted to throw that out there because I know that's a problem that we, I see in the gardens a lot of times that we forget to address. Well, it looks like we have no more questions. Um, so thank you for, um, to those of you who stuck with us, we went a little bit over, but when we have great questions, I'm not, I'm not the kind of person to tell you to not ask questions. So thank you for, for staying tuned for the entire time. And um, as Suzanne mentioned, if you have any questions, you know, she's listed a few different resources here um, in her PowerPoint and, and on this end page as well. Um, so, um, and if you can't remember her email or anything, you know, go ahead and, and email our CD and we can get you in contact with Suzanne. Yeah, thank you everyone so much. It was so wonderful to have you uh, with us tonight. I really appreciate your time and attention and uh, keep up the good work. Happy gardening. Excellent. Thanks so much, everyone. Have a wonderful evening. Thank you.